and preaching and and you know the the basic story, but I want to bring a message today about how to sabotage your joy. Everybody wants to be happy, don't they? Everybody wants to have peace in their heart. Everybody wants to be glad in the Lord. Everybody wants just a happy, joyful spirit. Except Jonah. (laughs) And he's going to teach us a lesson today. He's going to teach us how to sabotage your own joy. In 1982, the ABC Evening News brought a report on an unusual work of modern art. It was a chair with a 12-gauge shotgun attached to it, pointed directly towards whoever happened to be sitting in the chair. And that gun barrel pointed straight towards the chair. And the gun was loaded, and it was set on a timer to fire sometime within the next 100 years, but nobody knew. It was an undetermined time. Nobody knew what time that shotgun would fire. Well, it's a strange thing, but the amazing thing is that people stood in line for hours to have the opportunity to get a turn to sit in the chair and stare straight down that gun barrel knowing that it's set to go off sometime. They were gambling, they were gambling that that fatal blast wouldn't happen while they're sitting in the chair. And people seem to be gambling on a lot of things these days, and joy is one of them. It was foolhardy for anybody to sit in that chair. Yet, people who wouldn't dream of sitting in that chair spend a lifetime gambling with sin and going against God, and that's much more dangerous than a shotgun. Let's read our text in in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. We'll just read three verses, and we'll look at some others as we go through. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord." Now it talks about there that Jonah hears God's instructions to go to Nineveh and preach and warn that city. That, uh, Nineveh was the capital city uh, of the empire of Assyria and, and it was to the east of the Holy Land. Very wicked place. They were very brutal, mean, warlike. And They needed the preaching of the Word of God. America needs the preaching of the Word of God. And yet Jonah had the opportunity to please the Lord and just just head straight for Assyria and Nineveh. Yet he turned and went exactly in the opposite direction. Instead Instead of going east, he went west to Tarshish. The scholars think that that was probably somewhere on the shore of Spain, all the way to the other end of the Mediterranean, the edge of the known world at that time. So God said, go over here and preach. Jonah said, nope, I'm going over here. (laughs) That might be just a month's journey there, but I'm going 2,500 miles the other way. I'm getting away from God. Oh, man, that's worse than sitting in a chair with a shotgun pointed at you when we go against God. Jonah was a gambler, betting against God, lowering the boom on him. He set out to live life. Listen, Jonah set out to live life by his own guidelines instead of the directives of God. 
Let's pray together and see what we can learn. Father, I pray that you would bless us in this hour. May the, the sweet Holy Spirit come and, and take your precious word, the error-free word of God, and take it straight into our hearts. And Lord, help us to have an attitude adjustment that would make us to love the things that you love, to love your directions, your instructions, and your word, and your will. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Jonah was a gambler. He's betting that God won't get after him, but we see a different story. Many Christians do something similar today. <laughs> they sabotage their own possibility of having joy. Now, we started off by saying everybody wants to have joy. Everybody wants to be happy, and yet when God says go over here and we go over there, we ain't going to be happy. Yeah. And God's not going to chase us down to bless us while we're being disobedient to Him. The narrative of Jonah, everybody likes a good story. We see the reluctant prophet inflicting pain upon himself. Have you ever felt that way? Like you look around to blame somebody for your lack of joy, your lack of peace. You're looking to point the finger at somebody. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's somebody. Maybe it's another church member. But then finally you have to look in the mirror. And you say, I did this to myself. Yep. Jonah, instead of having abiding joy inflicted pain upon himself. Excuses were no good. He was guilty. He went the opposite way that God directed him and he sabotaged his own joy. How did he do it? Let's look at it in detail. Number one, he did it by running from God. Yep. He ran from God. Well, he tried to get away from God. Jonah 1 through, uh, 1 through 3 it talks about how he just went exactly in the opposite direction of what God told him to get, do. So he tried to get away from God. Do you ever try to get away from God? He's maybe, maybe there's some lost person. You know you need to be saved and you know God loves you and you know Jesus died on the cross to forgive your sins, but somehow you're running from God and anybody that would tell you about the love of God, you think it's like a rattlesnake and you run from it. It's never good to run from God. He tried to be busy ignoring God. I mean, God said, go over there and preach to that city. And Noah said, I'm just going to get on this boat and travel. and I'll hang in a hammock and just snooze. Do you ever try to ignore God? Do you know anybody that's just tried to ignore God? God's speaking. God's giving directions. But they say, I ain't listening. Well, he tried to get up. By going down. The news that he was supposed to go to Nineveh and preach the word of God, he didn't like those people at Nineveh. He hated those people at Nineveh. They were a brutal people. They were a sinful, ungodly people. And they had been very brutal towards Israel. And he knew all of that. And he's thinking in his own mind, go preach to that bunch of reprobates. I want them to die. And so he's kind of down downhearted at the news that God wants him to go over there and preach to those people. So he's kind of down and out, so he tries to get up, but instead he goes down. You remember the, the scriptures, we won't read them now, but it says he went into the ship, went down to, down to Joppa, going down to Joppa. I've actually stood at Joppa on the seashore of the Mediterranean. It's called Jaffa now in, in uh, modern times, but I stood right there at the place where, where Jonah embarked on his, his awful uh, sailing cruise. <clears throat> he went down. You have to go down. I mean, if you're up on Mount Carmel, man, you can look right down on the, the Mediterranean Sea, and he's in the mountainous holy land, Jonah is, and God says, go over and preach for me over yonder. And Jonah's disturbed about the news. But instead of getting up the proper way by getting close to God, instead of looking up, he went down. He went down to Joppa. He went down to the boat. And he went down in the boat to the lower level. And he's looking to hide from God. You can't ever get up by going down. Some people, are, some people are disappointed in life. Somebody wants to be happy and so they go down to the liquor store 
and try to find something to pick them up. They go down to the drug dealer and find something that will make them happy. They go down into sexual perversion. And I don't care what they say about the gays and Pride Month, it ain't gay. <laughs> and you can't go down in order to get up. And Jonah tried going down. So how did he sabotage his own joy? He brought God's hand of correction against him, number two. The restraint by God. God restrained. Jonah says, I'm going to run from God. God said, wait a minute, big boy. I'm going to get you by your galluses. Anybody hear those suspenders? Yeah, I've got some on. <laughs> Anybody hear of your suspenders being called galluses? Anybody remember that? Yeah, if you used to wear overalls, they called them galluses. <laughs> well, he's, uh, he's trying to run from God. Jonah's on his way down <laughs> to Tarshish. And God grabs him by the suspenders and says, I'm going to have to hold you back here, little boy. <laughs> going to get some things straightened out. God will do that to us. He'll get us to see the pants and drag us back. Some things are worth fighting for. I mean, there's something God is worth fighting for. <laughs> Your family is worth fighting for. Your church is worth fighting for. Morality and goodness is worth fighting for. But never fight against God. There's something that's worth fighting for. And if it's worth fighting for, then fight with all your heart. Fight like you're the third monkey on the ramp to Noah's Ark and it's already started to rain. But not everything is worth fighting for. In fact, it's dumb to fight against God. Jonah says... Uh, I'm going to do things my way. This is Burger King philosophy. Have it your way. Well, this brought the chastisement. God didn't just reach and grab him by the suspenders and hold on to him, but God gave him a couple of licks. God knows how to use the paddle. In Hebrews, it talks about the chastisement of God. When we decide we're going to go our own way, as a Christian, you can't do that. Well, you can try like Jonah did, but God knows how to spank. And the chastisement of God can be painful and seem to add sorrow. But you know, even chastisement, God is good. God is good by bringing storms of correction. Remember then the story of Jonah. Jonah gets in the ship and it comes up a big storm and man, that ship is tossed and torn and it's being thrown around in the sea and the sailors are about, they're about to give up and think we're going to die. They said, somebody's done something wrong around here. These were a bunch of pagans. They didn't even know the Lord. But they said, somebody is guilty of something. Jonah's down there asleep. You ever notice how some Christians just, instead of getting engaged in the things of God, they're just asleep. Asleep at the wheel. <laughs> you ever go to sleep at the wheel? Some of you guys that drive trucks, Danny, Brother Kepler. Some of the rest of you drove truck, Brother Jim. You ever drive truck? Now, you probably didn't do this because you're a professional, but I'm an amateur, and I've gone to sleep before. Back in the old days when I used to work on highway construction up north, I'd come home for a weekend sometimes, and I'd try to drive all night to get home. And usually it worked out pretty good, but then sometime about 4 o'clock in the morning, I'd drift off the edge of the pavement just a little, and you hear those gravel hitting the under rocker panels on your car? You ever done that? <laughs> The trooper says, don't be doing that. <laughs> Pull over and go to sleep. Well, there's a lot of Christians that are asleep at the wheel. And sometimes there has to be some rocks fly up and hit the rocker panel to wake them up. If it, that doesn't happen, or if they don't listen, they're going to find themselves in a ditch, or worse yet, up against a tree somewhere. Well, Jonah thought... Things weren't working out too good. And so he came out of the ship. He came up to the upper level and said, boys, it's me. God told me to go over yonder and preach to those people, and I didn't do it, and I'm the guilty one. And so he voluntarily walked the plank. <laughs> and God, all, all of this was designed by God. Hey, there's no accidents with God. <laughs> when you're doing wrong, God has got something there, a way to bring you out. You're doing wrong and you know it and God, you, you've lost your joy and God's going to try his best to give it back. Sometimes it means walking the plank, going into the water, being tossed by the waves and then swallowed by a big fish. 
You say, preacher, you really believe that story about the big fish, the whale swallowing Jonah? If God said that Jonah swallowed the whale, I'd believe that. (laughs) I just believe God's always right. Well, the the fish swallows Jonah. And you can read about it. (laughs) Well, in verse number four, it says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, so that there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man to his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship uh, into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship where he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, the gravel's hitting the rocker panel. (laughs) Arise and call upon thy God. If so be that God will think on us. (laughs) Boy, God brings storms into our life. That storm was not just an accident. That storm was meant to wake old Jonah up. (laughs) And when he went into the water, that didn't take God by surprise either. God had that fish waiting for him. (laughs) God, God lets us get into some things that feels hurtful, but it's for our own good. <clears throat> when he chastises, don't ever fight against God. You don't want to go in a fish belly. You don't lose your joy. I don't suppose Jonah had a lot of joy when he was walking the plank and fell into the water. I don't suppose he had a lot of joy when that fish swallowed him. I don't suppose he had a lot of joy when he found himself looking out between the bars of that rib cage of that whale. I don't suppose he had a lot of joy when he found the seaweed wrapped around his head in a stinky belly of a whale. But that was designed by God. And it was meant for good. I think the key is to learn from those situations. (laughs) I was talking to Mrs. Casey before before the service and I was telling her, I, I remember the time that her son Daniel and me, this was 20 years ago, I guess, and, uh, and I was wanting to go into beekeeping, and I found out about a bee tree up near my, my uh, brother's place in Izzard County. There was an old dead bee tree up there, and uh, the wind was going to blow it over anyway, so we decided to go and cut it down and, and rob the bees of their honey and then house the bees in a hive and bring them home, and I got Daniel to help me. Boy, was he naive. But you know, worse, I was older and I was more naive than him. <laughs> we decided we were going to get those bees. And so we went up there before dark, cut the tree down, got the honey out. Those bees were mad. I mean, they were mad, getting stung a little bit. And uh, I had a bee suit on, but those bees didn't seem to mind that suit at all. They got right through it. <laughs> and so we got the bees, finally got the queen in the hive and got the bees in the hive. And we waited until dark to come because you, you got to wait till all the bees go in. They go in at dark. And so we're up on top of Lee Mountain, which is about a mile, a mile and a half off of the road. Rocky and steep, rattlesnakes and wild animals of all kinds. We're, we're like in, the, in Kilimanjaro, you know. We're coming down off that mountain at night. And I'm carrying this hive of bees. And those things, I didn't know it at the time. You can be too naive for your own good. Bees really don't like to be fooled with at nighttime. If you think they can be mean and nasty in the daylight, you just try to handle them at nighttime. I'm carrying those bees down there and jarring them around, and I can hear them buzzing. And I can interpret their language. They were saying, Brooks, we're going to get you. (laughs) And and so we're carrying those bees along, and and that hive is slipping back and forth, and some of the bees are getting out. And as they get out, they're wanting to sting anybody within reach. They're stinging us all over, man. They're getting us good. Well, we finally got the bees back, and I put them in the bee yard. Well, I got two or three more hives later on. I'm a slow learner, and so I got two or three more hives, and I decided to move them to a soybean field, and so I had to move them at night. Got them out there in the orchard behind my house and, and go out there after dark when they're all in like you're supposed to, and I got them all boxed up and, and used staples to staple the different boxes together so they couldn't get out, and I could haul them safely to the bean field. Well, I was putting them on my trailer. <clears throat> One of the hives slipped apart. It's dark. The bees don't like to be fooled with in the dark. The hive came apart and there's bees everywhere. I mean, hundreds of them. And I'm by myself this time. And those bees come out and again, they didn't seem to mind that stu- suit. They're stinging me all over through my canvas suit. 
And, and so I finally get there. I mean, they're hurting me. And I thought, I'm going to have to get out of here and get away from them. These guys are so mad, I can't fix it. You know, I'm going to have to let them settle down. And I'll come back and see if I can put the hive back together. And so I walked away from the trailer a little ways, you know. And guess what? That cloud of bees followed me. Those things can see in the dark. <laughs> and so I went a little further, and they followed me. And so I began to pick up the pace a little bit. <laughs> and guess what? Bees can fly faster than you can run. Did you know that? <laughs> I can tell you from experience. I can. <laughs> and they're following me. And so I'm really going fast. And I'm old. I'm sweating. And I'm, it's hot summertime. I'm breathing hard. My heart is pounding. I'm trying to get away from them. They're stinging me all over. And so I get clear up to the house, which is like 100 yards away. And those bees are following me. Zzz, and they're just stinging me. And I'm, I'm in misery, you know. And so I think, I've got to do something. So I run around the house to try to get rid of the bees. They're still following, and they're still stinging. And then I got some inside my screened veil. And they're flying around inside the veil. And I'm still running around the house. I'm about to die of a heart attack. <laughs> and these bees are inside my veil, and there's that cloud of bees still following me. And so I figure, i got to do something. I'm kind of like Jerry Clower. Shoot up in here amongst us. One of us got to have some relief. <laughs> and so I'm running around the house. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I can't outrun them. And I've got some in my veil. The ones inside my veil, they're going to sting me. If I stop just for a minute, they're, they're going to sting me. And they're probably going to sting me if I keep running. So I'm thinking, in my <laughs> tragic situation, heart racing, mind racing, what do I do? I think, I know what I'll do. The next time I pass that patio door to keep these bees inside the veil from stinging me, I'll yank this hat off with the veil on it because it had elastic around the neck. I'll sling that off and run through the door into the house before they have a chance to get me and that cloud of bees following me. They won't get me. So I'm coming around the house the last time, about to drop dead from heart attack. I yanked that thing off and sling it and when I did, my glasses went flying off. I didn't find them for three weeks. <laughs> and I went through the door of the house Whew got a little relief. Don't move bees at night unless you really know what you're doing. I'm a slow learner. But you know what's worse than bees? It's when you're running from God. Yeah. A bee sting ain't nothing beside what God can do. When you know God's will and you run from it, boy, are you asking for trouble. Because you can sling a bee veil off, but you can't sling God off. You know, God, even in chastisement, God is, he's loving. Even in incarcerating us in our circumstances, like he incarcerated Jonah inside the whale. You know what, you know what good that done? It wasn't just to be mean to Jonah. God put him in that whale's belly for one primary purpose. He wanted him to have time to think. Hey, Jonah, what are you doing down there? I'm just sitting in this whale's belly. Got nowhere to go. All dressed up and no place to go. So what are you going to do, Jonah? Well, I can't get out. I better think this situation over. And so he begins to think. You know why God puts you in a situation sometimes when you feel like you can't go this way, you can't go that way, you can't go up, you can't go down, you're just there. You know why God gets you in a situation like that? So you can think. He wants you to reconsider. Come now, saith the Lord. Let us reason together. God had Jonah in a very loving place in that whale's belly. A place where Jonah had to listen. He couldn't run any longer. He's trapped like a rat. And God begins to speak to him and Jonah begins to think things over. And in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Now, Jonah, we're, now we're talking. Hey, it's always best to take time and just talk to God. When things are not going right, instead of throwing a fit, instead of running, instead of becoming self-willed, stop, think, and pray. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction. Why did he cry out to the Lord? Because of his affliction. When you're hurting, God's got you right where you, he needs you to be to listen. 
and start praying. And he says, and the Lord heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Verse 3, for thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and floods compassed me about, and thy, willow, thy billows and thy waves passed over me. And then in verse 7 of chapter 2, he says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. Uh, now you're getting, John, now you're getting to where you're supposed to be. You remember the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. God is compassionate in coming to the distressed, even during their chastisement. God shows up at the right time. Verse number 10 of chapter 2, it says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Boy, I bet vomit never was so pleasing in all of his life (laughs) as the smell of that whale's vomit. He hit the beach and things were about to get better. A person who is crossways with God. Now see, once, once Jonah got in the fish's belly, things got taken care of pretty soon. It didn't take several months. It just took a number of hours, three days. Everything seemed to get better. You see, Jonah had complicated things until he got into that place where he couldn't do anything but listen to God and talk to God. Sometimes we overcomplicate getting right with God. Have you ever been out of the will of God? Have you ever felt like God wanted you to do something and you resisted and you resisted and you made up all these excuses and all these reasons why you couldn't do the will of God? Well, if I do that, this will happen. Or if I do this, that will happen. Or somebody won't be pleased if I do the will of God. We make up all kinds of excuses and Getting out, getting out of the will of God usually happens slowly, but you can get back into the will of God pretty fast when you start talking to God. Yeah. It's simpler than it appears. <laughs> the medical staff was uh, <clears throat> reading a, a medical audio tape, listening to an audio tape by the doctor, <laughs> and uh, they came up on this diagnosis. Boy, they'd never heard it before. And uh, one of them asked the other, said, have you ever, ha- ever uh, heard of this condition, fallen from it? Fallen from a tree? And the other said, no, man, i never heard of that. That's a new one. What do you think that is? I don't know. And they passed it around. They're all talking about what is fallen from a tree. Never heard of it. So they finally contacted the doctor. And he listened to the audio tape himself. And he shook his head and told him. He says, this man has fallen from a tree. We make things difficult sometimes. And when we're out of the will of God, and he's had to bring chastisement on us, he had to give us a spanking or two, And we make it difficult, like there ain't no way to get right with God again. I'm just locked into this situation. You can get right with God right now. You can get right with God today. You can fall on this altar and say, God, I'm sorry. I've been out of your will, but I want to get right right now. And he's there before you. (laughs) He's like the father in the prodigal son story. The prodigal son is trying to think up all these things he can say to his father so he can get a meal and a bed to sleep in. And when he comes down the, the, the roadway, the father throws open his hands and runs to meet the son. God's waiting to do that for people that's out of his will. You know if you've not been doing right. And you can think up of a lot of reasons why you should just keep going in the direction you're going. The Tarshish. But getting right with God is pretty simple usually. Well, let's look at something else that happened in the life of Jonah. This is a strange one. He was reaching out for God. He was reaching out for God. You say, well, that's a good thing. Well, it is a good thing, but he went about it in the wrong way. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, Jonah was given a second chance. 
And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, that's what he should have done in the first place. Now he's reaching out to God in the whale's belly. He said, I'll, I'll do it, Lord, I'll do it. And so the fish pukes him out on the beach, and old Jonah gets up and kind of scrapes himself off a little bit and throws the seaweed off, and he says, I better get over there and get some preaching. And so he takes off. He's reaching out to God. But we're going to see that sometimes you can be obedient to God on the outside without being obedient to God on the inside. Like a little kid that kept getting on his mother's nerves and his mother said, if you do that one more time, I'm going to put you in the corner. And so he did it again. She said, now take that chair and put it in the corner. He took the chair over there and put it in the corner, but he was standing up. She said, I said, sit in that chair. So he huffed and puffed, and he sat down in the chair, and he said under his breath, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> we're, that, we're that way with God sometimes. God wants us to obey, and we say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it, but I ain't going to like it. <laughs> That's voluntary compliance but it's not truly obedience obedience is not just on the outside it goes all the way into the heart like God I agree with you Jonah was a source of blessing to the Ninevites he, he got there and, and it says in verse 10 of chapter 3 and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them and he did it not. So Jonah went and finally preached and the people started getting right with God. Well, he was a blessing to them but in his heart he didn't like it. He was preaching but he didn't like what he was preaching. He was saying it because he didn't want to be in a fish's belly again. Jonah was actually pleasing God with his outward actions. But number four and the last one, what steals our joy? What causes us to sabotage our own joy? Refusing a heart for God. This is where we're going to end right here. Refusing a heart for God. We're not talking about just doing something because somebody's watching. But we're talking about doing something because we're obeying from the heart. And we agree with God. Verse, listen to this in chapter 4. Boy, we preached through the whole book of Jonah this morning. Isn't that great? <laughs> Say, isn't that great? <laughs> well, I'm having a good time. Verse number 1, but it, displeased, it, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. See there? He, he didn't have his joy. He's unhappy. He's doing it, but he ain't enjoying it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. He didn't like it because those people were getting saved. What a preacher. <laughs> and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and Repentest thee of the evil. He's, Jonah's saying, I knew it. I knew it. That's why I ran to Tarshish in the first place. I knew if I went over there and preached to those Ninevites, you'd save them. Well, duh. You know what it's supposed to be? But he's mad about it. He said, I knew God. Now, he wanted the mercy and the grace and the compassion when he was in the whale's belly. But he didn't want God showing that same compassion to somebody else. Get them, God. Get them. Kill them. I mean, we, we go about doing our own will and we commit our sins, but yet we're quick to condemn somebody else's. And then in verse 3, it says, now, Therefore now, O Lord, I beseech thee, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. <laughs> 
What a jerk. Jonah, come on. You want to die because those people got saved? You want to die? Sure, they were wicked, but God saved them. It says they repented. Now you want to you want to commit suicide because they really got saved. Verse 4, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. He's thinking, maybe God will destroy them after all. I'll sit and watch for a while. Well, the sun was hot and the, and the gourd vine grew up and made him a shade. God showed him a little more mercy and compassion. But Jonah's still wanting God to rain fire down from heaven on that other bunch. And so then a worm comes along and eats up the gourd, the vine, and destroys the shade. And Jonah's all mad again. He's mad at God because he let the worm destroy his shade. Sometimes we get, we get bent out of shape, get our nose out of joint for some of the smallest reasons. And you know you do it. And I know you do because I do. <laughs> Sometimes we let little things irritate us. A stinking worm? Jonah's mad because a worm ate up some leaves on a vine? Yeah. <laughs> you know what's wrong with Jonah? Not only has he lost his joy, he's bitter and angry. He's mad. I mean, why would Jonah need to be mad. Sunday school teacher asked the children she was teaching the story of uh, the prodigal son coming home and, and the fatted calf. The father had the fatted calf killed and the other brother was mad. And the other brother was a Pharisee. And he's mad because the sinful brother came home got right with God. <laughs> and so the Sunday school teacher asked the children and said who was upset that the younger brother returned? And one child said, the fatted calf? <laughs> yeah. Jonah's mad about a worm. Jonah was doing the right things after his attempt at repentance, but it was half-hearted. Are you listening? Half-hearted repentance. When we say we're going to repent, we need to repent all the way. Yeah. <laughs> like the guy that... that uh, sent a letter and a check to the IRS for $1,500. He said, I, my conscience got to bothering me because I didn't pay this $1,500 on my taxes, so I'm sending you a check for it. If my conscience keeps bothering me, I'll send you the other $1,500. <laughs> you know, sometimes we're half-hearted in our repentance. Jonah's bitterness toward a group of people was a hidden sin of the heart. Jesus said, we better pay attention to the heart. Out of it are the issues of life. We can do the right things on the outside. Hey, people can come to church and not be right on the inside. I mean, you can actually come to church and even join a church and not even be saved. It's the heart that makes the difference. With the heart, man believeth under righteousness. That's why saying a, a repeated prayer to be saved or, or come forward in a service doesn't save anybody if a man believes in his heart. Trust the Lord in the heart. That's what saves him. I submit to you that churches all across America today are literally filled, many of them filled with people who have never turned their trust to the Lord for salvation. Because outwardly they're doing all the things that's right, but the heart never changed. Sin that is not dealt with stays entrenched in the heart and it'll hinder and hurt and steal your joy until you die. Jonah chapter 4 verse 9 says, And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. God asked Jonah a question. He said, do you think you're doing the right thing, being mad about this? Mad that I saved those people? Mad that I let a worm eat up your gourd? <laughs> Are you really sure you're good about doing this anger business? Jonah said, yep, I'm good. 
I'm good to be mad. I'm just going to stay this way. And you know, that's how the book ends. This book of Jonah ends where God is saying, Jonah, are you doing okay to be mad this way? Jonah says, yeah, I'm, I'm doing good to be mad. And God said, you don't think it was a good thing for me to get the gospel to these people over here that repented? The ones that didn't know beans about nothing, didn't know their right hand from their left? You, you don't think it's a good thing, Jonah? And then the book ends. Why did the book end that way? God just kind of left us hanging there. Whatever happened to Jonah? Well, there's no evidence that he ever got his joy back. No evidence that he ever, ever had joy at all. But we know he sabotaged himself from having joy. Yep. Now, he may have gotten right with God. I don't know. And maybe he didn't. And I think God may have left the book this way at the end so that you and I would ponder Jonah. What did he ever do? about this situation with his heart. Maybe God left it dangling that way so you and I could ponder not just Jonah, but about our own heart and answer that question ourselves. The book ends with that question. I mean, what about the heart? Why do I preach? Is it to try to just look like I'm fulfilling the role or is it because I love God's word and I love God? Why do you teach? Is it because you want to be busy in the work of God or is it more because your heart is in tune with God and you really want to please Him? Why do you tell people about Jesus? Is it just to get another notch on your gun belt? Or do you really see them as lost and dying and headed for hell and like God, you want to help rescue them. Why do you read the Bible? Is it so you can check off a box? I read my Bible chapters today. Uh-oh. Is that not a good thing? Yeah, it's a good thing. But why, why is my question. Reading your Bible is a good thing, but why do you read it? Do you really read it with a heart that says, Now, God, I want you to show me something that I ought to do, that I'm not doing. God, I want you to show me something that I'm doing wrong that I need to stop. Why do we read it? Is it a heart thing or is it an outward action? It can be both. The Christian who wants to experience fullness of life, abundant joy, peace in his soul, must stop sabotaging his own life. Have you found that elusive butterfly of joy? Or are you still shooting yourself in the foot? We need to have the right, right attitude and the right motives. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would bless us. And the Lord... We've probably all been guilty to one degree or another of running from you, running from your will, even possibly being mad at you because you did something we didn't approve of. And Lord, yet you're the, the God of the universe. You're our Heavenly Father. You're the one who the Bible says is love. You're the one that we ought to please. You're the one that said all things were created by you and for you. We're, we're created for your pleasure, Lord. I pray that if there's a Christian who's been out of the way, there's something that you want them to do and they fail to do it so far. Maybe they're running, maybe they're ignoring you. But God, I pray that this moment they'd reckon with themselves look into the mirror of their own soul and say, Lord, I'm tired of running. Help me to get it right and don't leave me dangling on the hillside like Jonah, bitter over a worm. Lord, help me to have a right attitude, a right spirit, a sweet spirit, and a right motive. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed.